Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Saturday, October the 28th, 2023. It is currently 1139 a.m. Central Time, and I am coming to you live from the Theology Central studio. Well, I think I'm still in Texas. I I think I'm still in Texas, but something weird has happened here in Texas. It's like 50 degrees outside, so I don't know. The world is coming to an end. It, it, It almost feels cold up here in the studio, so something is not right. I don't know what is happening, but yes, I'm coming to you live from the Theology Central studio located right here in Abilene, Texas, where the weather has taken a sudden turn the wrong direction, but besides that... We're probably getting ready to take a very wrong turn right here on this broadcast. See how I use that as a transition? Was that was that clever? Probably not. It was. It felt very forced, didn't it? Yeah, it was. It was probably forced because I didn't know what to say after talking about the weather. So I tried to try to connect it to this broadcast. But no, to be fair, to be honest, I am a little concerned about this. So. We are obviously still working on this very long series on the proper distinction between law and gospel. We're currently doing a law and gospel redo where we go back through the thesis found in the book, God's No and God's Yes, the proper distinction between law and gospel by C.F.W. Walther. We're working back through those theses. We're currently on thesis, I believe, number eight. Yes, thesis number eight, I believe. And we're working on it. Now, what we're doing is we're utilizing the audio from Issues ETC because they're going through the same book and and through the lectures of C.F.W. Walther on the proper distinction between law and gospel. As we go back through these, their discussion, and we're only using small segments from their discussions, has added, uh, I think, a whole new dimension and a lot of new information to our ongoing discussion. So I think it's been beneficial. However, there are times where this approach has taken uh, some very frustrating turns. Sometimes they're segments because they are so short because it's between commercials. You're kind of like, what was that? And then they, they did it last time. They've done it a few times. They're trying to make this major distinction between here's law, law condemns, law shows us what we're supposed to do, we're never going to do it, and the gospel is all about what Christ has done for you. And they make this beautiful distinction, which is a distinction that is much needed in the evangelical church today. However, little sometimes they'll slide over, well, the gospel is, yes, what Christ has done for you, but... Then they almost throw in, however, you have to completely surrender or you have to do this or you have to do that. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Now you're going back to the law and the law is not is not what I look to to show me that I'm saved. I look to the gospel and sometimes they confound the two themselves, even though they're trying to make a proper distinction, because I think it's just natural for us as humans. It's just natural for us to think. God does everything for you and saves you apart from anything you do. On one hand, we say amen to that, but we inevitably want to throw in, but, but, but wait, 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 no, 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 no. I mean, God does it, but if you don't do this, then you never got it. And if you don't do this, you you don't do that. We always want to start throwing in some kind of protection, I guess. We, 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 we don't want to make it too easy. And so we get very nervous. So it it gets frustrating sometimes when they start doing that. And the current thesis that we're looking at, Walther spent so much time on it that they are, they are still continuing looking at it. So, um, I don't know where, I have no idea where this is going to go. I'm hoping it goes somewhere interesting, but we will see. Let me just read the, the thesis again. So this is thesis. Yes, thesis number eight. I I keep thinking it's thesis number nine for some reason. I think we're supposed to be on thesis number nine, but they've dedicated like two programs to thesis number eight. So here we go. In the fourth place, this is from uh, God's, the proper distinction between law and gospel, God's no and God's yes, the CFW author. Here we go. Are you ready? Here's the statement. Thesis number eight. In the fourth place, the word of God is not rightly divided when the law is preached to those who are already in terror on account of their sins or the gospel to those who live securely in their sins. 
Now, they've had, they did a pretty good job trying. Well, I think even when they tried to talk about who's secu- who's, who is truly living securely in their sin, they didn't really articulate that super clearly. So I think I clarified that to some level, um, but we will just see where they're going to go. I really don't. I mean, that's always the the beauty of this. And that's always the, <laughs> the terror of this is I never know exactly where it's going to go, but we'll just jump in. Remember, they're coming out of a commercial break. So you're going to hear a little bit of their theme music. I always turn the volume way down for that. And then we'll slowly increase the volume as they come back in from the break. I don't know how long this segment will be, This is typically where the segments start getting almost like 10 minutes. Sometimes it feels like five minutes. So sometimes I'm kind of left with, all right, guys, thanks for listening. (laughs) I don't know what else to say, but we will see. Hopefully we'll find at least one thing from this discussion that we can take and we can do something beneficial with it. So let's go back to issues ETC. This is from the summertime. I think it was... July, I think when this was happening, maybe, maybe getting close to August. And uh, let's let's see what they had to say about thesis number eight. Here we go. Welcome back to Issues Etc. I'm Todd Wilkin. It's part nine of our series on the proper distinction between law and gospel. Pastor Will Whedon of The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is our guest. So, Will, he picks up in Proverbs 27, the verse, The full soul loatheth an honeycomb, but the hungry soul, to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. What does he do with that verse? Yeah, I mean, I think he summarizes it very succinctly with, The gospel, which is sweeter than honey and the honeycomb, is to be preached only to hungry souls. Because if they're full, they won't want it, right? The bitter thing, that is the law, he says. That's what you give to those who are not hungry. In other words, that's what makes people hungry for the good sweetness of the gospel is when they have the law administered to them. So he uh, just sort of divides it that way on that particular passage. And then he turns to the way that Jesus dealt with a particular category of people. That would be the Pharisees. And Walter's like, you know, by definition, these are people who think that their cup's full. They don't need anything that Jesus has on offer. They don't think about the needing the or the needing of the forgiveness of sins. When he, Jesus gives the parable of the publican and the Pharisee in the temple, do you remember the publican is praying, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner, you know, grant me a sacrifice of propitiation. And what is the Pharisee doing? He's sitting there thanking God. Well, I thank God that you know, I am thank God that, that, that you're so lucky to have a servant like me. Look at all that I give and do for you. My goodness, you're a very lucky God to have me. That kind of a person is the one that Jesus has nothing but words of woe and condemnation and judgment for in the Gospels. If you've ever read Jesus's fiery woe to the Pharisees and woe to the scribes in the Gospels, you, you sort of cringe when you hear him. Just He gives it straight to them as nothing but an expose of their hypocrisy. He just holds it up in front of their eyes for them to look at, and he charges them with being hypocrites, and he says they're going to be shut out of heaven because of this, because of what they've done. So he's really hard on them. And Walter comes back with, well, I know some of you are out there saying, but Jesus said, come to me all. And right away he says, yeah, we'll finish the verse. So Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. In other words, those who are crushed underneath the burden of the law itself, who look at what they've done and realize that they have no hope of salvation in their own life. They're the ones that he says, you come to me and I'm going to give you rest. I'm going to take this burden from you. I will bear it myself and I will give to you a completed and a perfect righteousness. Those are the people he calls to him, the crushed ones, not the ones who are thinking they just don't need Jesus at all. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to take this and I'm going to challenge this. You know, I always have a tendency to go the opposite direction. I understand theologically, theoretically, 
this need for making a proper distinction. Like, okay, this person needs the law. This person needs the gospel. I understand theoretically and theologically that concept, right? Because Jesus sometimes only seems to give people the gospel and sometimes he only seems to give people the law. And I understand that there may be even a biblical premise for doing such. However, there is a reality. There is a human limitation, limitation, a limitation here that we have to acknowledge. We are limited as human beings. There, they, we have a, a weakness. We have a problem here that makes this very difficult for us to exercise. We can say, yes, okay, this person seems to need law. This person seems to need gospel. And there are times we may try to make some of those distinctions. But let's remember something. Jesus could pull this off because he was God in the flesh. Jesus could pull this off because he knew what was in their heart. He knew what was in their mind. He could pull this off because he was God. We can't pull it off because we are limited. We are limited in our knowledge. We are limited in our understanding. I can't look into someone's heart. Externally, someone may appear to be, quote unquote, a secure sinner, and they act like they don't need God. But you don't know when it's midnight, one o'clock in the morning, as they're laying in bed, they're wrecked over their guilt. They're wrecked with shame. They feel horrible, but they have a facade of covering it all up by acting like I, you know, oh, I'm, I don't feel bad about what I do. And I, and nobody's going to tell me they, they're really good at covering it up. You don't know what's really going on inside a person. You don't have a clue. We're so quick to look at people and make judgments about them. Oh, that person is just a rebellious, arrogant jerk. And you don't know the insecurities, the weaknesses, the struggles that are going on inside. You never know what is going on inside a person. So we love in theology and within Christianity to just have these like, here's the approach you take. If someone does these two things and we just, we like to put people in categories, hardened sinner, secure sinner, broken sinner. Uh, We have, we rebellious, you know, we, we love to put them in categories. We love to break it down. We like to have formulas. We like to have a plan. We like to have methods. We like to, we like a five-step program. Stop. You're dealing with human beings and human beings are a little bit more complex than our simple theological formulas. Now, yes, there's sometimes you'll look at someone and think that they do need the law, but just remember, you don't really know what's going on. I think sometimes asking more probing questions and listening and trying to understand someone is far better than just coming at someone and hitting them with our theological formula that we came up with one day. Yes, I do realize in the Bible, Jesus makes these clear distinctions. He is, he is so harsh at the Pharisees. He tears them apart, but he's God. You could be tearing someone apart and be so wrong that it's not even funny. You could be like, that is a secure sinner. I'm going to give them law, 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 law. And all you're doing is literally destroying them, breaking them, and they already feel worthless. They already feel hopeless. They're already in a pit of despair. And you just threw 5,000 tons of, of more material on them to bury them. You have a responsibility to be a little bit more cautious And to be a little bit more careful and to understand our perception and our judgment of human beings is rarely accurate. We make judgments and decisions about people way too fast. We always think we have people figured out when we don't. And I, and I, I will argue that we don't even really have our own selves figured out, right? Sometimes we may think, man, I think I'm a secure sinner when the reality we're not. Sometimes we think, man, I'm broken over my sin when maybe we're really not. We have a hard enough time even trying to decipher and determine our own, our own motivations, our own thoughts, our own desires, because we, we will try to cover it up, justify, excuse. We, we play, 
we, we, we're constantly in a state of manipulating ourselves. I mean, if you think about it, we're in a perpetual state of being manipulated by our own selves. That's why the Bible describes, and Jeremiah, I do know that other manuscripts don't translate it this way, but the human heart is deceptive above all things. The most deceptive thing is your own heart. Well, if your own heart deceives you about yourself, then how, how much can you trust your judgment when it comes to other people? So I, I know that, that Walther wanted the, the gospel preached to certain people and the law preached to other people. And I know that the, the thesis make this, makes this distinction. Let me read it again. The word of God is not rightly divided when the law is preached to those who are already in terror uh, on account of their sins or the gospel to those who live securely in their sins. I think, look, here, I, I don't ever try to make an assumption. When talking to someone, if someone comes to you and they clearly seem to be broken and and just in terror over their sin. Now, please note, someone could act like they're broken and in terror over their sin, and it's full-blown manipulation. They they just want to cover up their that the reality is they just want someone to tell them that they are forgiven and that, that it's it's everything's okay, when in reality they don't. So you would never know. So, but I'm just saying when someone seems to be broken in terror over their sin, give them the gospel. When someone appears to be like, nope, I'm going to do whatever I want, remind them of the law. But you got to be, just realize that it's not always so simple. It's not always so simple. It's not always so simple. So you have to learn to be patient and listen and, and, and not make, and realize that your judgment is not, all, well, most of the time it's wrong. Most of the time it's wrong. I think most of the time we don't have a clue. I think we think we know people. I think we think we understand people and we don't. Now, maybe, maybe, maybe that's my own thing. Maybe because I get mad because I don't like when people think they know me, right? Because I'm always like, I think there's a little bit more to me than what you think, Right. So maybe because I don't want people to know me, whatever the case may be, but I, I'm just very sensitive to this when we, because I know Christianity loves to just break things down to this person fits this category. So now utilize this method. And it, it seems to reduce human beings to simply a problem to be solved, a puzzle to be fixed rather than a human being that is complex, that has emotions and desires. And it's not always so simple. Right? It's like sometimes when Christians speak of human sexuality, they, they so oversimplify it and not the complexities that arise within it. So, yeah. So, so there you go. He, he's just, I understand this distinction. Right? But you always just proceed with great caution. Proceed with great caution. That's what I would say. All right, let's continue. So, Walter writes again, thus he serves notice upon secure sinners, he keeps using that term, that he's not inviting them. They would only ridicule him if he were to lay his spiritual heavenly treasures before them. And the next passage that he turns to is really one of the most shocking passages in the Old or in the New Testament, in the Gospels, if you do not know the proper distinction between the law and the gospel. Listen to this passage. Mark 10, verses 17 to 22. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Walther comments, 
How does Christ answer the young man's last question? Does he say, ah, you lack faith? By no means. Since he's dealing with a miserable, secure, and self-righteous person, he does not preach one word of gospel to him. And notice that it says he loves him. He preached, he loved him enough that he preached the law to him in its full sternness. The point is that in this episode, Walter says, we have an example to guide us when we're dealing with such as are still secure and self-righteous. Now, I mean, <laughs> I love Walter's little caveat here. True, we can't issue orders such as Christ, the Lord of Lords, issued. You can't tell somebody, go sell all you have. But there are enough questions that we can ask to make a person of this kind realize that he's still deeply steeped in sins and is a lost creature. And that's exactly how Jesus treats this man. He treats him as a man who is so full of his own self-righteousness. All these I've kept since I was, isn't there any other commandment you can give me? I've, I've kept all those. He doesn't even see that he hasn't kept the first commandment because his God is his money. And it's not until Jesus actually tells him that he has to go sell it all, give it all away, that he is brought face to face with his own idolatry and walks away sad because he's thinking, uh, I can't give that God up. I'm gonna, I would kind of like to have the kingdom of heaven, but not at the price of giving up all my stuff. Not going to be something I do. Now, when this passage was misunderstood throughout much of the Middle Ages, this is a huge impetus to the whole monastic movement. People would think, oh, so all you need to do to be a real Christian, to be a real follower of Jesus, is to go and sell everything you have and give up the money to the poor or to the church, as most often happen, and then you will have treasure in heaven. Lots of people followed that path. You might think of probably one of the more famous ones. Remember St. Francis in the cathedral just stripping off every blasted piece of his clothing, everything, and walking out naked as he came into this world? He left all of his wealthy family behind, and he embraced what he thought was the way to salvation, the way of poverty. Okay. Now, I do appreciate the way they're trying to approach that text, but I'm going to, once again, offer a counter argument. I think that misrepresents the text. I don't think the text is telling us how to deal with a secure sinner. I think the purpose of the text is to demonstrate that anyone looking to justify themselves from the law will be condemned by it. I think that the purpose of that passage is to demonstrate that no matter how good you have been, no matter how wonderful you've been, no matter how, even if you think you've kept all the commandments, if you look to the commandments in any way, shape, or form for justification, I will dare say, this goes after the Lordship people, if you look to the law to even find proof of your salvation, that very law condemns you if anyone just simply takes the law going, oh, you followed this commandment? Well, then go do this. And you're going to be like, well, wait a minute. I, I, I. You're either going to start changing the law to water it down so that you don't have to do something. It's what people do with the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Turn the other cheek. Well, I mean, Jesus didn't mean to re like really turn the other cheek in case someone was physically attacked. No, no, Jesus still would allow me to have a gun and, and kill someone if they, because Jesus says, resist not evil, turn the other cheek, Bla love your enemy. Well, I mean, he couldn't mean it that way. And then we start finding all kinds of justification. People go through the Sermon on the Mount constantly looking to water it down. Why? Because when you read the Sermon on the Mount, you realize, I don't do that. 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 Well, I think the purpose of that story is to demonstrate anyone who thinks the law justifies them or they can find eternal life with it are going to be condemned by it. I don't think this is necessarily like, here's what you do with a secure sinner. Yes, sometimes dealing with a sinner, sometimes dealing with ourselves. You know what we have to be reminded of on a regular basis? I can't keep it. I can't keep it. I can't keep it. I can't. Because every day I'm reminded I can't keep it. I can keep it 97%. Guess what? I'm still failing in those 3%. And to be guilty of one point of the law is to be guilty of all of it. So I'm still a lawbreaker no matter how good I am. So that that's the reality. 
Now, what am I supposed to do with that? Run to Christ, acknowledge, confess, and then try to press toward living out my life the best of my ability so, to, to, you know, trying our best to pursue uh, righteousness. But we're, but the law will always condemn us. I don't know if that's necessarily a lesson on how to deal with a secure sinner. I think it's a lesson for every sinner and for every saint. Whenever you take your life and you lay it next to the law, you will walk away broken, grieved, and in despair because you can't keep it. You don't keep it. That to me is the main emphasis of that passage. He, they're trying to use it more as like, this is how you handle a secure sinner. You don't give them the gospel. You just give them the law. Well, right. Okay. I understand that. But really, I think it's more just demonstrate what, what happens when we try to live our life or pursue eternal life according to the law. And it, he is very right. Historically, this passage led many to the monastic life. That's why the Middle Ages, remember the, always the jokes about the Middle Ages, there were more Christians in the monastery than there were in the cities because people thought the only way I can follow the scriptures is to sell everything I have, give up everything I have, go live in a monastery, deny self, die to self because that's the way to Christianity. So many, but, but what's funny is many within the Lordship world will today say, how do you know you're saved? Because you deny self, you die to self, you love God and they give you all this test. Well, anyone who's even and remotely honest with themselves would be like, well, wait a minute. Am I really denying self? I got a wife. I got kids. I got a boat. I got a house. I got entertainment. I got a career. I got money. How am I really denying myself? Right? Like, so, so if you're really thinking, you say you love God supremely, but you have this and you have, if you literally, literally, literally loved God supremely, then give up everything, give up everything you have and show me you love God. Well, then they'll say, well, no, maybe I don't really love God as much as I thought. Okay. Well, then you failed the MacArthur test. So therefore, I guess you're not saved. See, if you really take those tests and push them to their limits, everyone would be like, I don't do it. That's the point. You don't. We all fall short. So what's our only hope? The finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, once we realize that, then we, we receive that wonderful gift of righteousness that is not our own, but it comes by faith. We take it and then out of gratitude, because of God's mercy, then we turn, forget the things which are behind, move forward and press towards the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We do press towards that, but knowing that we're going to be falling short over and over and over again. Even if we don't fall short externally with an action, we fall short internally with desire, thoughts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right, let's see where, where else they take this. It is quite clear that that just makes no sense unless you're properly distinguishing law and gospel. Yeah, you're just going to – in other words, if you hear this as, oh, man, that's really hard, but I can do it, you've missed the point of what he's trying to drive home to you with the command. He is definitely trying to expose the idolatry in the young man's heart and let the man see by that idolatry that he really hasn't loved his neighbor as himself the way he thinks that he has. Pastor Will Whedon is our guest. We are studying CFW Walther's proper distinction between law and gospel in our series. It's part nine of that series on this Monday afternoon. When we return, it's Acts 2 and the Pentecost Sermon. And there we have it. That ends the... Say, I told you these segments are so short. Sometimes it leaves us with much. So it doesn't leave us with a lot. So here's what I want to do. All right. First... I want now he read it quickly, but if you can write this scripture down, if you can open a Bible, Proverbs 27, Proverbs 27, verse 7, Proverbs 27, verse 7, Proverbs 27, 7. The full soul loatheth and honeycomb, but to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. Proverbs 27, 7, the full soul loatheth and honeycomb, but to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. That's Proverbs 27, 7. I want you to write that scripture down. I want you to think about it. I want you to meditate on it. 
I want you to just really try to figure out what the what the writer of Proverbs is saying there. Now, CFW Walther used it more towards a gospel kind of sal- salvific kind of way. The full soul loatheth and honeycomb. Well, he refers to, he connects the gospel to the honeycomb, right? Right. So he connects the gospel to the honeycomb saying a full soul, a soul that is full of themselves, their own self-righteous. They're going to loathe the honeycomb. They're not going to want, want it. But the, but to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet to the, to the one who is broken over their sin and they're hungry and they're, they're, they, they know that they have nothing. Then they're going to have a different approach. I don't know. I don't know if that's a correct application of that verse, but the verse is obviously giving us some piece of wisdom and maybe just offering a practical practical application of a truth, right? Because I think it, when, when you're, when you, when you seem to have everything, then, then what's the big deal about a honeycomb, right? If you're full, what's the big deal about a honeycomb, right? I'll, I can, I'll say it this way. If you can have ice cream every single day and any kind of ice cream you want, and then someone offers you ice cream, you're like, yeah, big deal. I get all the ice cream I want. I'm full. But if you are hungry, you have a hungry soul, then every little thing, even maybe something that's bitter, you will take it and it will be sweet and you will appreciate it much more. Well, how, well, how does that apply to our everyday life? And, but how does it apply to our spiritual life? Well, I think sometimes if we, we can be so, so full and satisfied with everything in this world, that then maybe the spiritual thing isn't appealing to us. But when we are feel the spiritual hunger, when we truly feel spiritual hunger, then we find satisfaction even in those things that are bitter. So I don't know. I don't know exactly how to apply that. So he he took it in a, in a certain direction and you can go, oh, really good. But I really want you to just meditate on that and just spend... Spend a good portion of the day just meditating on that passage, on, on, on it, because I think it's, it's I, I, I want to spend some more time with it, and hopefully you do as well. So, so work on that. Uh, that's Proverbs 27, 7, Proverbs 27, 7. And then I want you to consider um, the story he, t- he told, hang on, or the, the passage he used. Is it here in the thesis? I didn't write it down. Um, I know the story. I can find it here in just a minute. Um, it may be right here in the book. Um, do they quote where it is? And of course, uh, CFW Walther doesn't even give the reference. I know it's in the Gospel of Math- Matthew. Give me one second. I'll find it in just a second. I don't think they mentioned uh, the actual scripture. I don't think they mentioned the actual scripture in the episode either. So just give me one sep- second. Okay, it'll take one second. It is Matthew. See, that's Mark 10. Let's see here. It's the Mark 10 passage. Matthew 19. Is it Matthew 19? I think it's Matthew 19. I think it's Matthew 19. Let me see if I'm correct. Let's see if I'm correct. Matthew 19. Let's see here. And yes, Matthew 19, starting in verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Matthew 19, 16. It goes from 16. Uh... Yeah, go to uh, go to Matthew nineteen verse sixteen to twenty th- about twenty two. Matthew nineteen sixteen to twenty two. That will be the passage. You can look up the cross references. I want you to spend some time with that story of the rich young ruler. Just understand all of the great damage that has come by people not understanding the proper distinction of long gospel in church history. This led people to sell draw sell everything they had. And then go join a monastery because they didn't know how else to live this out in a practical way. No, the story is to show you, you do not keep the law, period. You And, and to look to the law for 
anything, any justification of any kind, whether to save you or to prove you're saved, if you're even remotely honest with what the law really demands, you would realize you don't keep it, and then you would be broken and in despair, and then that's where the gospel can take care of that and bring comfort and bind up the brokenhearted, because then, well, now you, you have seen the reality. So Proverbs 27, 7, I want you to think about that today. Proverbs 27, 7 and Matthew 19, 16 to 22, Matthew 19, 16 to 22. Those are the two passages we will take uh, from this segment that we just reviewed. And there you have it. There you have it. I always, I always hate these short segments. I hate them because I'm always left with, well, what else can we do? But there's not a lot, a lot. I think I tried to offer a little bit of a distinct take on each one of those concepts and hopefully that was beneficial. But I think the Proverbs 27, seven passage, I think Walther maybe had been, had been taking a little bit too much liberty with it, but it is a passage for us to really meditate and consider. And the, the story of the rich young ruler Yes, I, that has been, that story has been abused by so many within the event, not only in the Middle Ages, but even within the evangelical world. And it just demonstrates if you do not have a proper, a proper understanding of a proper distinction between law and gospel, you will not end up with a proper interpretation. It's a very key element to a proper hermeneutic. All right, you can email me, newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. All right, thanks for listening. We'll probably be doing other broadcasts today, and hopefully whatever we do, you'll find to be beneficial and helpful. Thanks for listening. Everyone have a great day. God bless.